Hi, I'm Sridhar Subramaniam. I go by Sri. And uh, since we're doing this uh, fun thing of using our employee number, I'm employee number 10, so I was the 10th to join the company. Uh, <laughs> that's right, yes, it's, it's a hash. We all have hashes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, how we're taking this notion of uh, object storage and, you know, a file system on top of object storage and uh, evolve this design to, uh, to, to high IOPS environments, right? High IOPS use cases and kind of take advantage of the SSD IOPS potentials in the 5210. So, um, first we're going to look at some challenges in object storage performance. And uh, then I'm going to kind of like um, harken back to the one block software architecture we've been looking at to, from a performance perspective. Then we're going to talk about our um, high IOPS B plus 3 file system. And then um, point out how we can get to our scale out object placement um, uh, related to how we distribute the blocks, uh, di distribute the objects uh, uh, around the cluster. And then we're going to look at the content addressable stores, which um, um, allow us to store billions of objects on each uh, disk drive. So, and don't worry, this is not another two-hour session, right? <laughs> Even though he's going to address this. It's right. <laughs> yeah. Each is like one and a half slides. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so these are generic ch challenges, right, for object storage and performance in that um, in that realm. So object has vendor specific definitions, you know, and it comes with its own challenges. There are various sizes, so, so, so that's just like a pinch of salt. And then, um, so the three prong problem here is how are, you know, files, things that we can recognize represented as objects by a storage system. Um, and then the second problem is like how are objects distributed across multiple storage devices so that your storage capacity can scale out. And then the third is um, how are objects laid out in each, at each storage device. So for each of these, we can look at like, okay, what are the challenges, challenges in getting high IOPS, right? So how does Exablox solve this problem? So our object definition is fairly simple, right? We have an ID that's a content-based ID, it's a content-based key, and then the content itself. So that's why they're content addressable objects. So, um, and then how are files represented as objects? We have a B3, B plus three based file system um, that renders uh, a file system tree in terms of our objects, in terms of Xbox objects, right? And the B plus three file system is designed such that high object IOPS given by the substrate, given by the underlying layer, can translate to high file system IOPS, which is what the user really cares about, right? Um, and then the second challenge, how we talk, tackle that, how do you distribute objects around the storage devices? You know, this goes back to Charles's presentation of how we have the placement groups around the cluster, and we dis distribute it uh, without using any metadata server. So we don't incur any metadata IO in object distribution or finding an object in the cluster. The third is how are, you know, on a given storage device, how do you lay out objects? You know, we've been talking about object ID and how do we, you know, and the value, right? How do you get from the ID, ID to the location of the object? So that is a problem that each, each content addressable store has to solve. So this is the architecture picture we've been looking at. And kind of the main thing to notice here is that um, the currency above this line, above the line of objects and object IDs, it's all in terms of the content itself, right? It's a uh, in terms of user file content, you know, and their directory content, um, and there's nothing about the actual location of the objects because you know it's all in terms of the object ID and the distributed content addressable object store, and um, the storage devices inside take care of what goes <coughs> where, and you know by splitting the problem we're able to do it better than legacy system legacy systems that try try to solve all the problems in the file system. So, okay, so B plus three is an old uh, computer science data structure um, that we leveraged for this purpose. And the, the advantage, the, the way in which we are using this is 
we're allowing a fan out at each level of the tree of in the hundreds. So typically when you see a computer science tree, you know, we draw like a binary tree or something, you know, like, okay, just a couple of children from each, each node in the tree and so on. Whereas the kind of tree we're talking about that we've implemented, uh, it has, each has like 600 children. So now this multiplying factor, what that gives you is that you can quickly jump to your content, the, you know, some 8K within some file that a user has within just a couple of hops down the tree, right? The wider it is, the broader it is, the shallower it is. Um, so for example, so for example, you know, if you have a seven terabyte file system, in just one, uh, one object IO, you can fetch that object. So one file IO translates to one object IO. And then if you have an even bigger four petabyte file system, we have to fetch one of the interior nodes of the tree, and then we have to fetch the data object. That's two object IOs. So in two object IOs, you can do one file IO, right? So this, having this really broad, shallow tree lets us translate object IOPS, which the substrate gives us, to file IOPS. Um, so again, the, uh, this whole tree lives in, tr in terms of objects, right? So both the data and the metadata, everything is in terms of objects. And that allows us to do disaster recovery in parallel. There was a question about this earlier, right? You could have multiple streams of activity going through, these, to, through this B plus tree while a DR replication is also happening concurrent with it. Do you have uh, client software or standard NFS? Yes. The exported protocols are NFS and SMB okay. at this point. No client software. No it's client just standard software. NFS or SMB. Oh, so when, a, when a customer comes down, you've got a seven node cluster, it can go to any one of those nodes in the cluster to do a metadata operation, like find a file or something like that? So a subset of the nodes are, um, have the run the protocols, right? So you, we have a virtual IP that spans across the cluster. And once they make the NFS or SMB request to that virtual IP, the software decides where that goes. So even though each one blocks in a cluster will have its own IP address, there's a virtual IP address for the ring. So in an, an NFS request, you just have the IP address and then the export name. So that request is routed to the appropriate one blocks that's running the microservice for NFS. And then you're one hop away to the, uh, to the uh, Data. Uh, IO. Mm -hmm. And uh, an object is variable length or? Yes. Right. So we are shaking our heads for the audio, for the recording, by the way. <laughs> In the up right. and down yes. motion. <laughs> right. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that was the first problem, right? Like how do you translate files to objects? And then this is the second prong of the problem, which is like, how do you place objects? And you know, and Charles talked in quite a bit of detail about that. The only touch point there that I want to mention is that we don't have MDS, you know, like other cluster storage. So we don't have to go do an IO to fetch metadata, right? The, the overall theme of how we achieve IOPS is by doing as few, you know, storage IOs as possible. The, Less you go to disk, the more you can translate the ability of the SSDs in terms of high IOPS to user-visible high IOPS. Okay, so this is the middle part of the problem, right? And then once we zoom into the content addressable store, so what this is in concrete in terms of uh, the 5210 that we talked about. So you got, um, in one you have, um, 10 drives in the front, right? Okay, I don't know if that's 10, but so in each of those, we have the content addressable object store software running. So not on the drive itself, but there is software running on behalf of that drive. And each of those can ha hold billions of objects. So why do we design for billions of objects? because SSD sizes are growing geometrically, right? They're not growing linearly. So when we have eight terabyte, 16 terabyte SSDs, we wanna be able to have um, content addressable object stores that can address all the objects within those SSDs. 
So there's two parts to how we go in with an object ID and get to the data. Well, first you have to jump from the ID to the offset of the data, and then you gotta fetch the data, right? So that's why there are two, two, two big parts to the uh, CA object store. So one is the index, and we invented our own index uh, called TableStack. And the, the biggest reason we did this was existing key values databases like RocksDB, LevelDB, they all have logarithmic properties that they, they work great when you're talking about like low millions of you know, index lookups. Um, when you get to the billions, they start to break down. They start to do lots of disk IO just to fetch one translation, right? One ID to offset translation. So, so with ours, one flash IO, we can get to any, um, you know, we can do the translation, right? We can do the index translation from object ID to offset in just one flash IO. Um, so this is patent pending work. Um, and uh, uh, the find, adding an entry, modifying, delete, everything is in order of one time in computer science terms um, or in constant time. Uh, the journal, which is where the objects are actually stored, is very media friendly for both flash as well as spindles. And how is that? Because when we're writing out objects, we write multiple objects at a time because we don't want to do, you know, both for spindles as well as flash, you don't want to be doing small random writes, right? So we consolidate the object writes into journal pages. But when you need to fetch an object, it's just one media IO. So in summary, when you come down to a content addressable object store, you're doing one fetch, one IO for getting your uh, index lookup, doing your index lookup to find where the object is, and then another IO to get the object. And with these two IOs, you've done an object read, right? So that's the, the gist of this whole slide, like translating an object IO to media IO, right? With two media IOs, we can get to an object, which is, you know, a lot more, it's like the theoretical minimum. It's approaching the theoretical minimum of um, how you can do a key value store. So the file name to object ID mm -hmm. in a typical environment takes, you know, one to some number of IO through the B tree structure. Correct. So, right. So if you're operating on a largest file like a VMDK, you've already traversed down the path. You have a handle to the contents of that file, and then you need to find a particular yeah, offset. To, to some block or something like that, some offset, you would use the object ID to index structure right. to find that. Yeah, correct. Because the, in, the, in the tree, the parent node has the content key, content addressable key, right? And you take that key and then put it through the object placement math, and you know which drive, right, which CA store has your object. Right. When you go to that CA store, like you mentioned, you do the index read, data read, you have your object. Yep. And what's actually really nice about that is since both that meta information and the data objects themselves are all in the same system, the faster that goes, the more improvement you see to the top. And that's actually a critical component of not having metadata services. You'll see a lot of systems, you have to scale out the metadata server because you're getting so much meta query that they actually start becoming the bottleneck because everyone's pounding on them trying to find out where things are. This is actually, I mean, it's really cool. And if you look at the B plus tree, it's so shallow that the top part is in memory. Because, you know, the best part about IOPS is if you didn't do IO, you'd be really, really fast. But right. customers yeah. seem to want to get the data. Yep. <laughs> Oh, cool. And that metadata action actually occurs at like file open or something like that. And then after that, it's pretty much, yeah. Yeah. you already know what the object IDs for the object are and yeah. you're just processing through those. Right. Yep. Yeah, especially nowadays with VMs and containers, we are dealing with large files where there's like random read and write all over the place, right? Yep. So, um, since you already filed the file for the patent, we can talk about this now. Um, so, yeah, what is the idea behind table stack? So you take an even key, key space, or a random key space, right? Like you have your 
object IDs from 0, 0 to, 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 to FF. Sorry, this is hexadecimal. Um, you have this key space. And if you s choose a bucket based on the first few bits of the object ID, then that is pretty much approaching the theoretical limit of how fast you can look something up, right? So like you take the key, you find the bucket for that key, go read that bucket, you have it. So that's the first table, right? But the trouble with that is randomness is not the same as evenness, right? Randomness has uneven spots here and there. And that's where the other tables, that's where the stacking comes in. You have smaller tables that catch the spillover from the buckets that are over full in the first table. But the fact that the first table is broad has several advantages. The first advantage is that most of your data is there. Most of your index entries are there. And once you go to it, you, you can go back to the translation. Um, it's only in the exceptional case would you even look in tables two or three, and they're there to make sure that you don't hit a premature full of the index. So, and the other uh, cool part is like the recent uh, index translations are all in the RAM table, so you can actually do an index translation without incurring any IO, right? So I said one because you know I want to talk about the average case, but you know there for recent data, you can actually jump, you can jump from ID to offset all in memory. Hey Sri, how many objects can we support with table stack? I've tested a billion. <laughs> yeah, literally, and <laughs> um, and it's it's limited only by the speed of the media underneath. So. It's uh, like I was, I was, yeah, I was myself surprised. I was like, wow, okay, so this particular SSD can do 95,000 IOPS. Table, sc table stack can do 95,000 finds per second. And when I clubbed multiple SSDs, I was able to do 180,000 um, finds per second. So it scales with the media. So all this translates in terms of the the top half, as Charles was talking about, in terms of NFS and SMB coming in to the distributed content addressable object store, that all the stuff that Sri talked about in terms of the indexing and table stack and so forth, that's going to allow us to deliver about 30,000 IOPS for the 5210 in a 1U form factor. That's, is that read? That's 70, 30, read, write, read right, 32K sustained. So we'll get, we'll get the inflated numbers as well. Um, but that's under a 7030 workload. What about um, <laughs> reducing the right I.O. on the flash to minimize wear? It's actually, you want to talk about the, the, yeah. how we write and why that's flash friendly? Right, so, um, right, there are two parts to that question, right? Since we are an object store, right, so we have to store the index entry as well as the data, right? In terms of storing the data, we accumulate in non-volatile RAM, um, the data coming in so that we can buffer up more objects. Okay. So when you have, when you buffered more up, then say you write a two megabyte sequence of objects to flash, then you're covering pretty much a, an erased block, right, in, uh, in popular flash architectures. But essentially, yeah, the bigger chunks you write, the less work the flash translation layer has to do, right? Um, so that's the object content side of the answer. Mm -hmm. In terms of the index entry, we actually landed in RAM table and actually had that little diagram. So if you see, um, what actually happens is from the RAM table, the entries that you recently added goes into a log, into a linear log, so that you've actually persisted the index translation, right? And, but it stays in the RAM table so that when that bucket fills up, you can take hundreds of entries together and flush them down to the persisted table one all in one shot. So instead of incurring one IO for every entry, it's less than one IO. Right. And does, does that affect your choice of SSDs? Because obviously you've been very specific on your SSD choice. Or are the, are the size of your chunks too big to be impacted by the, the block um, architecture of the SSD? So we go into the hundreds of kilobytes, and in the case of the journal, into the megabytes, yes, to make sure we can address many different types of SSDs yeah, so and relevant. their behavior. Yeah, right. Yeah. We, we want to be able to support many different yeah. SSDs. Yeah, and Chris, that's one of the reasons, like with the PM863, that only has like a 0.7 drive write per day, yeah. but that's over two terabytes per day. Yeah. 
<coughs> five years. So.